Welcome to Judging Freedom. Judge Andrew Napolitano here, my relatively new podcast where I get to think as I wish and say what I think and talk to some very interesting people. Today, one of the smartest people that I know, Professor Victor Davis Hanson, who has a long and stellar academic career, but is also a noted and noteworthy commentator on the craziness that goes on uh, in the world today. He is currently a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, one of the greatest uh, think tanks in the country and an institute with which I am familiar and I'm familiar with his work there and I admire his work. Professor Hansen, it's a pleasure. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You uh, recently wrote a fascinating piece called Third Worldizing America, in which you were critical of the FBI, as I have been, uh, of its uh, pursuing people in the United States just because they express political opinions or engage in behavior that's a little different but without really any articulable suspicion as to criminality. Can you tell us about this? Yes. Um, it was in a larger landscape, and I've written about it before, that traditional or conservative America was usually the bastion of support for the intelligence investigatory agencies as well as the Pentagon. But we've seen what uh, there's been a, some abuses in the Pentagon. We've seen what the intelligence communities have done. And now we're looking at the FBI and I mean, James Comey under 240, 245 occasions under oath said he could not remember or didn't know. And he, whether one likes Donald Trump or not, it's not, it's not sustainable for the FBI director to have a private conversation with the president, memorialize it on an FBI document uh, apparatus, then leak it to the, the media and then explain under according to him that he was not under investigation when he was under investigation or it's not sustainable for the acting fbi director to say on four occasions to a federal investigator that he was not the source of a leak to the wall street journal when he knew he was and he admitted that he had lied under oath to investigators whether that under oath is literal or figurative i'm not sure it's not sustainable for Kevin Kleinsmith, an FBI lawyer, to forge a document as part of a FISA request. A FISA request, which is based on a dossier, which I think the FBI had plenty of information, was not reliable. It's not, it's not sustainable for the acting FBI director to get in cahoots with the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosentine, and discuss uh, wearing a wire to entrap the president of the United States. Well, what then, are the what is the FBI doing now under the direction of Attorney General Merrick Garland, formerly a highly respected appellate judge, and before that a highly respected official of the Department of Justice? But what is Attorney General Garland having the FBI do now, which is shocking to me? involving local boards of education and parents that want to speak their minds. I don't know what he's doing, but he's denied that he's doing it, even though the facts contravene that. And so he's apparently feels that the FBI now under his aegis is sort of, uh, I don't know, a crusader, a woke crusader agency. And he's going to be at the spear tip of social justice causes. And so whatever one's politics are, you cannot weaponize the FBI like it's been weaponized. We haven't really seen this in, in generations. And uh, I don't know anything about James O'Keefe, really. I've met him once. I don't know anything. I've never met Roger Stone. But the idea that the FBI sends a veritable SWAT team, uh, an armed, almost as if they're going into battle into the citizens of these to serve a subpoena against people who have no history of violence. And then beforehand, either in one case, CNN and the other, the New York Times is tipped off as if it's some kind of show uh, extravaganza. It's not becoming, it's not sustainable for the FBI to do that. They're losing, I guess what I'm saying is they're losing support for the FBI in the very areas where it had been the strongest. And now it's- the You know, you're, you're right. And it is intriguing that conservative Republicans who have generally supported the FBI and the um, intelligence apparatus entities in the federal government are now uh, feeling its, um, its sting. 
uh, I did some reporting on the Stone case, and Roger Stone's been a friend of mine for many years. They sent 29 FBI agents, including a helicopter and a gunboat and a canal behind uh, Stone's house and a battering ram, all while they were negotiating with Stone's lawyer. And they could very well have said, by the way, we're going to indict your client tomorrow. It's got 48 hours in which to appear. Instead, they they engaged in, in an invasion with an armada at 530 in the morning with CNN uh, in tow. I have yeah. seen some reports, and I suspect you have as well, about FBI making inquiries of parents who have shown up at local school boards to say, I don't want my children to be taught about LGBTQ. I'll teach them about sex at home. I don't want them to be taught about Project 1619 from the New York Times, which teaches that the country is still basically racist. I don't want them taught about Black Lives Matter, which teaches that racism is so endemic in our culture that only violence can get it out. And I don't think you should be teaching them that. No, a parent makes a statement like that at a school board meeting, perfectly protected, absolutely normal free speech. And the FBI investigates. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. But then again, this is the FBI. You remember during the Robert Mueller case where we had two principal FBI, one investigator, Peter Strzok, and one Lisa Page that were obviously biased and using their FBI cell phones to communicate in a way that would reveal that bias. And then when they were let go, Robert Mueller deliberately staggered their departures, not to suggest that there was anything on toward or connection between them. And then under subpoena, the FBI claimed that it could not find numerous cell phones in its possession. And they were, and then when they were produced, their records were wiped clean. So it's, it's, I don't know how, what the, re, the alternative is, whether the investigatory roles should be divided up among the various agencies or it should be relocated to Kansas City or something, but there is something toxic about its prominent location and consolidation of power right in Washington, D.C., and we've, we're seeing it uh, at its most uh, disturbing manifestation. And then last week, we learned in a report by Michael Horowitz, the inspector general of the Department of Justice, which candidly looked at other entities in the DOJ besides the FBI, but zeroing in on the FBI, as you and I are in this conversation, that the FBI spent $300 million to bribe and, and pay its informants in a period of eight years, 40, on top of that, $42 million a year uh, for their uh, expenses. And this is the biggest head scratcher. The, this, this number blew me away, Professor. They authorized their informants, many of whom are criminals themselves and have an indictment against them and are only working with the FBI because the FBI promised them, if you help us entrap so-and-so, we'll ask the prosecutors to go easy on you. You might even walk. They authorized these people to commit 22,500 crimes in a four-year period, many of which were state crimes. So the FBI had to go to a state prosecutor and say, that guy you just arrested for robbing a bank, he's working for us, so you got to let him off the hook. Well, this is yeah. mind-boggling that the it FBI is. decides what laws should be enforced and what laws can be broken. I know, and I think that's why even sort of moderate commentators, I think I remember a column maybe a month ago by Holman Jenkins in the Wall Street Journal, he called for the abolishment of the FBI as we know it. And remember, during the crowds, uh, the email scandal on the run up to the 2016 election, whatever one's politics were about Clinton or Trump, it didn't do anybody of any party persuasion for the FBI director to have these uh, performance art press conferences that yeah. there is new information, there's not information. And then when the hard drives were targeted for investigation, for some reason, uh, James Comey allowed a former top FBI uh, security expert in, in this new company, CrowdStrike, to have electronic possession of the hard drives. And they ran the investigation, not the FBI. And the FBI took them at their word, even though they were employed uh, by people in the Perkins Coey uh, DNC circuit that were also working for Hillary Clinton. So they're incestuous. And I think that uh, it, it comes from this 
this very dangerous culture that we've developed the last 30 years. Ah, you, in put your, you put your finger on it, Professor. It's a culture. It's a yeah. culture in federal law enforcement that they themselves are above the law, that it they is. can decide what laws will be enforced and what laws won't be enforced. The president can't authorize crimes, theoretically. The Congress can't authorize crimes. It could rewrite a law, but it can't authorize somebody to break a law that they've already that's already been enacted. The courts can't authorize crimes, but the FBI thinks that it can authorize crimes. So what are, what are the dangers to our society when the government breaks its own laws? Well, it's kind of acting as if it's a legislature and making or choosing to follow the law it prefers. And then it's also an executive branch by enforcing what it wants to enforce. And it's also a judicial branch by uh, calibrating its enforcement in a punitive fashion. It, and so they, they, they've combined sort of in Western terms, judge, jury and executioner, and they're not accountable. Right. And it's not just the we talked about the invest the intelligence, but when you look at distinguished people in the intelligence committee, and I can remember James Clapper being asked under oath, "Does the NSA spy on private individuals?" Right. He said no. And he, when he was caught lying, he said, "I gave the least untruthful answer." Right. right. John he, Brennan did the he same. Should thing have been about, indicted. He should he have should been have. indicted for perjury. That was one of the more scandalous uh, public uh, crimes. Let's uh, switch gears a little bit, Professor, to another area of interest to those watching us now and to you and me, and that is the weaponized. This is mainly done also by the executive branch, but not by law enforcement. The, the weaponizing of vaccinations and the demonizing of those who exercise their conscience, whether it's for religious or bodily integrity reasons, not to be vaccinated. Where is this going to take us? I don't know, but we're suspending really the practical protections of the Bill of Rights. And it, we, it's all under the cloak of science, but it's, it's pseudoscience. If you're in Europe today and somebody has got COVID in the past and has an antibody titer, I think it's four or 500, then that is equivalent of a vaccination. We don't even allow that in the United States. So if I've talked to a person not long ago and he does not want to be vaccinated because he got a bad case of COVID. Right. He was told by his doctor, if you get a Moderna or Pfizer, you will have a higher chance of a reaction because you have such a high, and he can't go to a restaurant in some places in new york he's traveling to new york he can't get a he doesn't have a car and i don't know where we gave again judge jury executioner powers to dr fauci but he was at one point adjudicating whether a rental agreement between a landlord and tenant would be yeah. enforceable or not on yeah. his recommendation of the severity of the crisis and you know when we're asking four and a half million soldiers and together with federal employees that they have to be vaxxed or they, and then we have 2 million people coming across the southern border when we're not asking anything of them and they're foreign nationals. It's almost as if the resident or the foreign national has more exemption from the law than- What has what really goaded me, and thank you for that gloomy but accurate picture that you painted, is that these vaccination mandates aren't even the law. They're executive decrees, yeah. either issued by the president through OSHA, the Occupational Health and Safety Administration in the Department of Labor, that's been stayed by two federal judges, or they're issued by governors or mayors. There's no statute enacted by Congress saying you have to be vaccinated. There's no statute enacted by a state legislature or even a city council requiring it. This is a profound violation of the separation of powers when the executive branch can craft a rule, call it a law, and then use the police to enforce it as if it were legislation enacted by the, uh, uh, the legislative branch. It's just yeah. a destruction of the core of the Constitution. We could see that. I, I could see what the practical effects were as early as March 2020 in these small rural communities. You, If you went in to a florist shop, to a shoe store, to a family-owned cleaners, they were shut down and the people were put out of business. 
but you could go to the local Walmart and Target and you could go to the flower section, you could go to the shoe section, you could go to the cleaning section. And I, I never understood why it was safer to put a lot of people in one big room than these small mom and pop where you might be the only person in the store, you knew the person. So there was no scientific rationale and it really distorted really this has distorted the US economy in the last two years. Yes. It's really in it's really made very rich people who are already very rich. In that um, list of mom and pop stores that were closed and suffered, at least in New York and New Jersey, there was not liquor stores. So <laughs> you could have five hundred people in a liquor store cheek by jowl waiting for their turn to buy alcohol and the government doesn't care but you want to put 25 or 30 people in a church or a mosque or a synagogue, or as you say, a shoe store, or a florist shop. And the, and the government said, no, before I let you go, tell me about your farm, because we are both political legal commentators, but we're both also farmers. Well, I'm on a, I was in a 180 acre um, tree and vine farm, plums, peaches, almonds, raisins, fresh grapes, uh, what my great great grandmother founded, and I'm sitting in a house that's 150 years old that I'm the fifth generation to live in. But uh, during the turmoil of the millennium and marriages, everybody sort of moved away from California or they left the farm, and I'm left with the original house and 40 acres, and I have almonds now. But then I drive, you know, about 180 miles once a week to Stanford, but I prefer it's much nicer, I think living out here for a while. I grew up here. I'm living in the same house when I was a little boy. So so we grow uh, uh, apples, pears, corn, and green leafy vegetables. Wow. But our highest and best product is maple syrup. We tap about yes. 350 sugar maple trees. You no. probably don't think of New Jersey and maple syrup. No, the same not at all. Thought. It's actually are a big industry out here. Are those natural or cultivated maple trees? Do they are natural. natural. The natural. Um, and one of the people that was surveying the property said to me, Judge, these are virgin forests. They have never wow. actually been touched. That's and, amazing. and it's as natural a product as there is. You just boil the sap down until it gets thick enough and sweet enough. And, and then it's syrup. It's, uh, it's great stuff. That's I will right. somehow get a bottle of it to you if you get me some of your almonds. Okay, I will do that. Professor uh, Victor Davis Hanson, one of the smartest people I know, and it's a, it's a joy to be with you. I hope you can come back to uh, Judging Freedom again. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you for having me.